1984 by George Orwell, Part 2, Chapter 9. Winston was gelatinous with fatigue. Gelatinous was the right word. It had come into his head spontaneously. His body seemed to have not only the weakness of a jelly, but its translucency. He felt that if he held up his hand, he would be able to see the light through it. All the blood and lymph had been drained out of him by an enormous debauch of work, leaving only a frail structure of nerves, bones and skin. All sensations seemed to be magnified. His overalls fretted his shoulders, the pavement tickled his feet, even the opening and closing of a hand was an effort that made his joints creak. He had worked more than 90 hours in five days. So had everyone else in the ministry. Now it was all over. He had literally nothing to do. No party work of any description until tomorrow morning. He could spend six hours in the hiding place and another nine in his own bed. Slowly in mild afternoon sunshine, he walked up a dingy street in the direction of Mr. Charrington's shop, keeping one eye open for the patrols. But he was irrationally convinced that this afternoon there was no danger of anyone interfering with him. The heavy briefcase that he was carrying bumped against his knee at each step, sending a tingling sensation up and down the skin of his leg. Inside it was the book, which he had now had in his possession for six days, and had not yet opened, nor even looked at. On the sixth day of hate week, after the processions, the speeches, the shouting, the singing, the banners, the posters, the films, the waxworks, the rolling of drums and squealing of trumpets, the tramp of marching feet, the grinding of the caterpillars of tanks, the roar of massed planes, the booming of guns. After six days of this, when the great orgasm was quivering to its climax and the general hatred of Eurasia had boiled up into such a delirium that if the crowd could have got their hands on the 2,000 Eurasian war criminals who were to be publicly hanged on the last day of the proceedings, they would unquestionably have torn them to pieces. At just this moment, it had been announced that Oceania was not, after all, at war with Eurasia. Oceania was at war with East Asia. Eurasia was an ally. There was, of course, no admission that any change had taken place. Merely, it became known with extreme suddenness and everywhere at once that East Asia, and not Eurasia, was the enemy. Winston was taking part in a demonstration in one of the central London squares at the moment when it happened. It was night, and the white faces and the scarlet banners were luridly floodlit. The square was packed with several thousand people, including a block of about a thousand schoolchildren in the uniform of the spies. On a scarlet draped platform, an orator of the inner party, a small lean man with disproportionately long arms and a large bald skull of which a few lank locks straggled, was haranguing the crowd. A little rumpled skin skin, rumpled skin skin figure, contorted with hatred, he gripped the neck of the microphone with one hand, while the other, enormous at the end of a bony arm, clawed the hair menacingly above his head. His voice, made metallic by the amplifiers, boomed forth an endless catalogue of atrocities and massacres, deportations, lootings, rapings, torture of prisoners, bombing of civilians, lying propaganda, unjust aggressions, broken treaties. It was almost impossible to listen to him without being first convinced and then maddened. At every few moments the fury of the crowd boiled over and the voice of the speaker was drowned by a wild beast-like roaring that rose uncontrollably from thousands of throats. The most savage yells of all came from the school children. 
The speech had been proceeding for perhaps 20 minutes when a messenger hurried onto the platform and a scrap of paper was slipped into the speaker's hand. He enrolled and read it without pausing in his speech. Nothing altered in his voice or manner or in the content of what he was saying. But suddenly the names were different. Without words said, a wave of understanding ripped through the crowd. Oceania was at war with East Asia. Next moment there was a tremendous come up commotion. The banners and posters with which the square was decorated were all wrong. About half of them had the wrong faces on them. It was a sabotage. The agents of Goldstein had been at work. There was a riotous interlude, riotous interlude while posters were ripped from the walls, banners torn to shreds and trampled underfoot. The spies performed prodigies, prodigies of activity in clambering over the rooftops and cutting down the streamers that fluttered from the chimneys. But within two or three minutes it was all over. The orator, still gripping the neck of the microphone, his shoulders hunched forward, his free hand clawing at the air, had gone straight on with his speech. One minute more and the feral roars of rage were again bursting from the crowd. The hate continued exactly as before, except that the target had been changed. The thing that impressed Winston in looking back was that the speaker had switched from one line to the other, actually in mid-sentence, not only without a pause, but without even breaking the syntax. But at the moment he had other, other things to preoccupy him. It was during the moment of disorder, while the posters were being torn down, that a man whose face he did not see had tapped him on the shoulder and said, Excuse me, I think you dropped your briefcase. He took the briefcase abstractedly without speaking. He knew that it would be days before he had an opportunity to look inside it. The instant that the demonstration was over, he went straight to the Ministry of Truth, for the time was now near, nearly 23 hours. The entire staff of the Ministry had done likewise. The orders, already insisting from the telescreen, were calling to their posts were hardly necessary. Oceania was at war with East Asia. Oceania, Oceania had always been at war with East Asia. A large part of the political literature of five years was now completely obsolete. Reports and records of all kinds, newspapers, books, pamphlets, films, soundtracks, photographs, all had to be rectified at lightning speed. Although no directive was ever issued, it was known that the chiefs of the department intended that within one week, no reference to the war with Eurasia or the alliance with East Asia should remain in existence anywhere. The work was overwhelming. All the more so because the process that involved could not be called by their true names. Everyone in the records department worked 18 hours in the 24 with two three-hour snatches of sleep. Mattresses, mattresses were brought up from the cellars and pitched all over the corridors. Meals consisted of sandwiches and victory coffee, wheeled round on trolleys by attendants from the canteen. Each time that Winston broke off for one of his spells of sleep, he tried to leave his desk clear of work. And each time that he crawled back sticky-eyed and aching, it was to find that another shower of paper cylinders had covered the desk like a snowdrift, half burying the speak right and overflowing onto the floor, so that the first job was always to stack them into a neat enough pile to give them enough room to work. What was worst of all was that the work was by no means purely mechanical. Often it was enough merely to substitute one name for another. But any detailed report of events demanding care and imagination, even the geographical knowledge that were needed in transferring the war from one part of the world to the other, was considerable. By the third day, his eyes ached unbearably, and his spectacles needed wiping every few minutes. It was like struggling with some crushing physical task, something which one had the right to refuse, which one was nevertheless neurotically anxious to accomplish. Insofar as he had time to remember it, he was not troubled by the fact that every word he murmured at the speak right, every stroke of his pencil, ink pencil, was a deliberate lie. He was as anxious as anyone else in the department that the forgery should be perfect. On the morning of the sixth day, the dribble of cylinder slowed down. For as much as half an hour, nothing came out of the tube. And one more cylinder, 
then nothing. Everywhere, at about the same time, the work was easing off. A deep and, as it were, secret sigh went through the department. A mighty deed, which can never be mentioned, had been achieved. It was now impossible for any human being to prove by documentary evidence that the war with East Asia or Eurasia had ever happened. At 1200, it was unexpectedly announced that all workers in the ministry were free, free till tomorrow morning. Winston, still carrying the briefcase containing the book, which had remained between his feet while he worked and under his body while he slept, went home, shaved himself, and almost fell asleep in his bath, though the water was barely more than tepid. With a sort of voluptuous creaking in his joints, he climbed the stair above Mr. Charrington's shop. He was tired, but not sleepy any longer. He opened the window, lit the dirty, oil, uh, dirty little oil stove, and put on a pan of water for coffee. Julia would arrive presently. Meanwhile, there was the book. He sat down on the sluttish armchair and undid the straps of the briefcase. A heavy black volume, amateurishly bound, with no name or title on the cover. The print also looked slightly irregular. The pages were worn at the edges and fell apart easily, as though the book had been passed through many hands. The inscription on the title page ran, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism by Emanuel Goldstein. Winston began reading. Chapter 1. Ignorance is Strength. Throughout recorded time and probably since the end of the Neolithic Age, there have been three kinds of people in the world, the high, the middle, and the low. They have been subdivided in many ways. They have borne countless different names, and their relative numbers, as well as their attitude towards one another, have varied from age to age. But the essential structure of society has never altered. Even after enormous upheavals and seemingly irrevocable changes, the same pattern has always reasserted itself, just as a gyroscope will always return to equilibrium, however far it has pushed one way or the other. The aims of these groups are entirely irreconcilable. Winston stopped reading, chiefly in order to appreciate the fact that he was reading in comfort and safety. He was alone. No telescreen, no ear at the keyhole, no nervous impulse to glance over his shoulder or cover the page with his hand. The sweet summer air played against his cheek. From somewhere far away there floated the faint shouts of children in, in playing. In the room itself there was no sound except the insect voice of the clock. He settled deeper into the armchair and put his feet up on the fender. It was bliss. It was eternity. Suddenly, as sometimes one does with a book, of which one knows that one will ultimately read and reread every word, he owned it at a different place and found himself at chapter three. He went on reading. Chapter three. War is peace. The splitting up of the world into three great superstates was an event which could be, and indeed was, foreseen before the middle of the 20th century. The absorption of Europe by Russia and of the British Empire by the United States, two of the three existing powers, Eurasia and Oceania, were already effectively in being. The third, East Asia, only emerged as a district, distinct unit after another decade of confused fighting. The frontiers between the three superstates were in some places arbitrary, and in others they fluctuate according to the fortunes of war. But in general, they follow geographical lines. Eurasia comprises the whole of the northern part of the Euro European and Asiatic landmass, from Portugal to the Bering Strait. Oceania comprises the Americas, the Atlantic Islands, including the British Isles, Australasia, and the southern portion of Africa. East Asia, smaller than the others and with a less definite western frontier, comprises China and the countries to the south of it, the Japanese islands, and a large but fluctuating portion of Manchuria, 
Mongolia, and Tibet. In one combination or other, these three superstates are permanently at war and have been so for the past 25 years. War, however, is no longer the desperate, annihilating struggle that it was in the early decades of the 20th century. It is a warfare of limited aims between combatants who are unable to destroy one another, have no material cause for fighting, and are not divided by any genuine ideological difference. This is not to say that either the conduct of war or the prevailing attitude towards it has become less bloodthirsty or more chivalrous. On the contrary, war hysteria is continuous and universal in all countries, and such acts as raping, looting, the slaughter of children, reduction of whole populations to slavery, and reprisals against prisoners which extend even to boiling and burying alive are looked upon as normal. And when they are committed by one's own side and not by the enemy, meritorious. But in a physical sense, war involves very small numbers of people, mostly highly trained specialists, and causes comparatively few casualties. The fighting, when there is any, takes place on the vague frontiers whose whereabouts the average man can only guess at, or around the floating fortresses which guard strategic spots on the sea lanes. In the centres of civilization, war means no more than a continuous shortage of consumption goods and the occasional crash of a rocket bomb, which may cause a few scores of deaths. War has, in fact, changed its character. More exactly, the reasons for which war is waged have changed in their order of importance. Motives which were already present to some small extent in the great wars of the early 20th century have now become dominant and are consciously recognised and acted upon. To understand the nature of the present war, for in spite of the regroup regrouping which occurs every few years, it is always the same war, one must realise in the first place that it's impossible for it, for it to be decisive. None of the three superstates could be definitely conquered even by the other two in combination. They are too evenly matched, and their natural defences are too formidable. Eurasia is protected by its vast land spaces, Oceania by the width of the Atlantic and the Pacific, East Asia by the fecundity and indus, indus, industriousness of its inhabitants. Secondly, there is no longer in the material sense anything to fight about. With the establishment of self-contained economies, in which production and consumption are geared to one another, the scramble for markets, which was the main cause of previous wars, has come to an end, while the competition for raw materials is no longer a matter of life and death. In any case, each of the three superstates is so vast that it can obtain almost all the materials that it needs within its own boundaries. Insofar as the war has direct economic purpose, it is a war for labour power between the frontiers of the superstates and not permanently in the possession of any, any of them, there lies a rough quadrilateral with its corners of Tangier, Brazzaville, Darwin and Hong Kong, containing within it, within it about a fifth of the population of the earth. It is for the possession of these thickly populated regions and of the northern ice cap that the three powers are constantly struggling. In practice, no one power ever controls the whole of the disputed area. Portions of it are constantly changing hands, and it is the chance of seizing this or that fragment by sudden stroke of treachery that dictates the endless changes of alignment. All of the disputed territories contain valuable minerals, or some of them yield important vegetable products such as rubber, which in colder climates it is necessary to synthesize by comparatively expensive methods. But above all, they contain a bottomless reserve of cheap labor. Whichever power controls equatorial Africa, or the countries of the Middle East, or southern India, or the Indonesian archipelago, disposes all of the bodies of scores of hundreds of millions of ill-paid and hard-worked coolies. The inhabitants of these areas, reduced more or less openly to the status of slaves, pass continually 
from conqueror to conqueror for an expended like so much coal or oil in the race to turn out more armaments, to capture more ter territory, to control more labor power, to turn out more armaments, to capture more territory, and so on, indefinitely. It should be noted that the fighting never really moves beyond the edges of the disputed areas. The frontiers of Eurasia flow back and forth between the basin of the Congo and the northern shore of the Mediterranean. Islands of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific are constantly being captured and recaptured by Oceania or by East Asia. In Mongolia, the dividing line between Eurasia and East Asia is never stable. Around the pole, all three powers laying claim to enormous territories, which in fact are largely uninhabited and unexplored. But the balance of power always remains roughly even, and the territory which forms the heart line of each super state always remains inviolate. Moreover, the labor of the exploited peoples around the equator is not really necessary to the world's economy. They add nothing to the wealth of the world since whatever they produce is used for the purposes of war. And the object of waging a war is always to be in a better position in which to wage another war. By the labor, the slave populations allow the tempo of continuous warfare to be speeded up. But if they didn't exist, the structure of world society and the process by which it maintains itself would not be essentially different. The primary aim of modern warfare in accordance with the principles of doublethink, this aim is simultaneously, simultaneously recognized and not recognized by the directing brains of the inner party, is to use up the products of the machine without raising the general standard of living. Even since the end of the 19th century, the problem of what to do with the surplus of consumption goods has been latent in industrial society. At present, when a few human beings when few human beings even have enough to eat, this problem is obviously not urgent, and it might not have become so, even if no artificial processes of destruction have been at work. The world of today is a bare, hungry, dilapidated place compared with the world that existed before 1914, and still more so compared with the imaginary future to which people of that period look forward. In the early 20th century, the vision of a future society unbelievably rich, leisured, orderly and efficient, a glittering antiseptic world of glass and steel and snow-white concrete was part of the consciousness of nearly every literate person. Science and technology were developing at a prodigious speed and it seemed natural to assume that we'd go on developing. This failed to happen partly because of the impoverishment caused by long series of wars and revolutions, partly because scientific and technical progress depended on the empirical habit of thought, which could not survive in a strictly regimented society. As a whole, the world is more primitive today than it was 50 years ago. Certain backward areas have advanced on various devices, always in some way connected with warfare and political police espionage have been developed, but experiment and invention have largely stopped, and the ravages of the atomic war of the 1950s have never been fully repaired. Nevertheless, the dangers inherent in the machine are still there. From the moment when the machine first made its appearance, it was clear to all thinking people that the need for human drudgery, and therefore to a great extent for human inequality, had disappeared. If the machine were used deliberately for that end, hunger, overwork, dirt, illiteracy and disease could be eliminated within a few generations. And in fact, without being used for any such purpose, but by a sort of automatic process, by producing wealth which it was sometimes impossible not to distribute, the machine did raise the living standards of the average human being very a human being very greatly over a period of about 50 years at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th centuries. It was also clear that an all-round increase in wealth threatened the destruction, indeed in some sense was the destruction of a hierarchical society. 
In a world in which everyone worked short hours, had enough to eat, lived in a house with a bathroom and a refrigerator, and possessed a motor car, or even an airplane, the most obvious and perhaps the most important forms of inequality would already have disappeared. If it once became general, wealth would confer no distinction. It was possible, no doubt, to match a society in which wealth, in the sense of personal possessions and luxuries, should be evenly distributed, while power remained in the hands of a small privileged caste. But in practice, such a society could not long remain stable, for if leisure and security were enjoyed by all alike, the great, the great mass of human beings who are normally stupefied by poverty would become literate and would learn to think for themselves. And when once they'd done this, they would sooner or later realize that the privileged minority had no function, and they would sweep it away. In the long run, a hierarchical society is only possible on the basis of poverty and ignorance.